Hello, this is Meteorology 113, Lecture 3, Atmospheric Carbon, Nitrogen, and Sulfur Cycles. This is the third lecture of Course Module 1, The Natural Unpolluted Atmosphere. To motivate this lecture, we return to a slide from Lecture 1, showing the composition of gases in the atmosphere. Outside the main gases, nitrogen, oxygen, and water vapor, there are several trace gases that were pointed out. Among these are several important air pollutants, which are noted in the blue font. The important greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane, are also indicated. Scanning the elements that comprise the chemical compounds of these air pollutant and greenhouse gases, one can see common elements. Nitrogen, for example, in nitrogen oxides and ammonia. Carbon, for example, in carbon dioxide, methane, carbon monoxide, non-methane hydrocarbons. And sulfur, for example, in sulfur dioxide and hydrogen sulfide. These elements are combined with hydrogen and oxygen in various ways amongst these compounds. Among the species noted on the previous slide is nitrogen dioxide, NO2. This is a portion of a general class of nitrogen compounds called NOx, NOx, which includes other NO compounds besides NO2. The slide shows a visual of nitrogen dioxide, the familiar brown hazy cloud of air pollution gas that often blankets major cities. Los Angeles is a, on a typical day as shown here, typical polluted day, and is an example of this. The brownish color of nitrogen dioxide is because this gas absorbs violet and blue sunlight, letting the other colors, yellows and reds, pass through which in combination appear brown to the human eye. The high levels of nitrogen dioxide in urban areas is mainly because of emissions of this gas from tailpipes of automobiles, among some other sources. The nitrogen comprising NO2 that gets emitted comes primarily from nitrogen in the air in the form of N2 that gets pulled into the combustion chamber of the vehicle. The high heat within the combustion chamber then converts some of this N2 in the air to nitrogen dioxide, NO2. Nitrogen dioxide, however, also has some natural sources. Among these are lightning strikes. This strong source of heat, the strong source of heat within lightning, converts some of the N2 in air into NO2. The image in this slide is a map of the frequency of lightning strikes around the world, expressed in the number of lightning strikes per square kilometer per year. So in understanding air pollution, it is important to appreciate that an air pollutant gas can be formed due to both human or anthropogenic processes and natural processes. Formation of nitrogen dioxide within the combustion chamber of a motor vehicle is one example of an anthropogenic source of NO2. Lightning is one example of a natural source of NO2. So in this lecture, we will give a very basic overview of the natural cycling within the Earth atmosphere system of three important elements comprising the gases we just saw, nitrogen, sulfur, and carbon. We will understand better the physical processes and chemical compounds associated with these elements as they cycle around the Earth atmosphere system. From this natural cycling, natural or background concentration levels of these compounds in the absence of strong air pollution sources occur in the atmosphere, and we will describe these. This lecture will provide a background for further focus on air pollution in the next module. The outline below shows how the lecture is organized.
nitrogen cycle. Shown here is a visual of the nitrogen cycle through the Earth's system. The main reservoir of nitrogen in the is, is in the atmosphere in the form of diatomic nitrogen, N2. which as we learned, comprises around 78% of the dry atmosphere. Nitrogen, however, is also a requirement for life, involved very much in the biochemistry of plant growth and protein formation. Nitrogen in the form of N2, as it is stored in the atmosphere, however, is a very stable molecule and cannot be utilized directly by plants. Instead, Natural processes within the nitrogen cycle act to convert nitrogen as N2 in the air, from N2 in the air, into other fixated compounds that can be processed by living organisms. Amongst these fixated nitrogen compounds are nitric acid, HNO3, ammonia, NH3, and various nitrates and nitrite ions subsequently formed by chemical reactions involving these fixated nitrogen, previously defined nitrogen fixated compounds. The, the, these processes by which fixated nitrogen is produced span, very, span the various ways a small part of atmospheric nitrogen becomes chemically transferred to these various uh, fixated compounds as part of the nitrogen cycle. These processes include the reaction of, with water vapor and absorption in rainwater that leads to nitric acid, lightning, which leads to NO2, and microorganisms in the soil, which convert nitrogen into nitrates and outgas a portion of this to the air in the form of ammonia. The ammonia nitrogen-based fertilizers used in modern agriculture are a human method of, in effect, providing fixated nitrogen for plant growth. Finally, we note in the upper right side of this graphic, anthropogenic air pollution sources of nitrogen, automobiles, trucks, factory combustion emissions, which provide nitrogen oxides, NOx, to the air which can, which can be considered an unintended human method of fixating nitrogen from N2 into NOx. As we learned a bit ago, NOx in the form of NO2 is among the air pollutant species of concern. This slide gives a more detailed view of nitrogen fixation within the soil by microorganisms. The details on this slide do not need to be known for the upcoming quiz, but the slide is still shown to support and broaden understanding of material presented on the previous slide. Sulfur cycle. Shown here is a visual of the sulfur cycle through the Earth's system. Unlike nitrogen, there is no large repository of sulfur in the air. Instead, various sources emit sulfur into the air from the Earth's surface, maintaining trace air concentration levels of sulfur in the form of various species. From an air pollution perspective, sulfur dioxide, SO2, enters the air mainly from coal combustion. Historically, and still among the primary ways electricity is generated. Natural sources of SO2 also exist, however. Most importantly, volcanic eruptions and outgassing from volcanoes. Once in the air, over several days, sulfur dioxide converts to sulfate particles and within precipitation can dissolve into sulfuric acid High, level, high levels of SO2 dissolution into rainwater, in fact, can cause rainwater to be highly acidic, 
leading to acid rain, which you may have heard of. The main repository of sulfur in the Earth's atmospheric system instead is in the Earth and living organisms. Degradation of living matter then releases sulfur to the air in the form of SO2 and also various reduced compounds, for example, hydrogen sulfide, which has a familiar rotten egg smell. Landfills, wastewater treatment plants, and composting facilities, in fact, can produce large emissions of smelly sulfur gas as organic matter decomposes within these facilities. Students in this class may be familiar with these smells driving along Highway 880 and Highway 237 near Milpitas and Fremont, where many such facilities exist. Carbon cycle. Shown here is a visual of the carbon cycle through the Earth's system. The main repository of carbon in the form of many different chemical compounds is the Earth, oceans, and plants. Carbon is stored in all living matter. Carbon buried deep underground over millions of years, in fact, provides the fossil fuel resource in the form of oil, natural gas, and coal that modern society has powered itself by over the industrial era. In the air, carbon is mainly in the form of carbon dioxide at trace levels of a few hundred parts per million over the last thousands of years. The maintenance of this small background CO2 level in the air arises from roughly an equal balance between photosynthesis removing CO2 from the air and respiration releasing CO2 back into the air. Oceanic removal processes are also involved in this natural cycling. We also note methane, CH4, another carbon-containing compound and, and an important greenhouse gas. This is released from biological degradation, livestock, and other agricultural emissions, among other ways. Levels of methane in the air are currently at trace values of around a couple parts per million, 100 times less than CO2. In terms of air pollution, the main source of additional carbon in the air is due to fossil fuel combustion, for example, from automobiles and other mobile sources, and industrial factories, power plants, and other stationary sources. Combustion releases carbon to the air mainly as CO2. This is not an air pollutant in the traditional sense, since carbon dioxide at normal concentration levels that we experience does not pose a health hazard upon respiration. Instead, the main carbon-based air pollutants due to combustion in terms of respiratory hazards are carbon monoxide, smoke particles, and various hydrocarbon gases. We will cover these in more detail later in the semester. Concentrations of these other species in the air are much less than carbon dioxide. The natural processing of carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur through the Earth system gives rise to small trace levels of chemical species, concentration levels of chemical species associated with air pollution in nature. That is, in most cases, there is a natural non-zero concentration level of a species in the air, even if no major air pollution source exists nearby. In environmental science terminology, these natural levels are called background concentration levels. Background levels of four species noted in the previous slides are shown here. Carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, and sulfur dioxide. Background concentration levels of carbon dioxide are currently around 410 parts per million, with levels increasing over recent decades, as we will show shortly. The next three species are among the main air pollutants we cover, we'll cover later in the class. Carbon monoxide background concentrations are around 100 ppb. Nitrogen dioxide background concentrations are only a few ppb. And sulfur dioxide levels are in fact quite small in the background air, typically less than one part per billion. 
Memorizing precise values is not important. Instead, the focus is on two main points. First, that a non-zero background concentration level of species exists independent of any major air pollution source. And second, that these background concentration levels are usually very small, often a few ppb or less. The previously presented slides describe the main processes by which these small background levels exist in the air through cycling of the nitrogen, sulfur, and carbon composed, comprising these species within the Earth atmospheric system. The students should be familiar with the main processes presented on these previous slides. As just mentioned, Carbon dioxide concentrations in the air have been strongly increasing over the industrial era as a result of fossil fuel combustion. This slide shows CO2 levels measured from the Moana Loa Observatory atop the Moana Loa volcano on the Big Island of Hawaii at 11,000 feet above sea level. Being so high in elevation and in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, Moana Loa is a place where clean remote air can be sampled away from major cities and pollution um, emission sources. Along the vertical axis is air concentration in parts per million. And along the horizontal is year starting from late 1950s to current day. There is other monitoring of CO2 further in the past from indirect methods, which are not shown on this slide. Looking at the graphic, one can see the steady rise of carbon dioxide levels over recent decades, increasing from 320 parts per, parts per million in 1960 to current day values of 410 parts per million. In fact, levels were fairly steady at 280 parts per million for much of the last thousand years prior to the industrial era. Fossil fuel combustion over the industrial era then proceeded to release much additional carbon to the air over the next couple hundred centuries, couple centuries, and continues to today. This has raised CO2 concentration levels in the years steadily over this period. The additional CO2 in the air is in turn being found to be the primary, primary driver for global temperature rise and climate change we are experiencing. Global climate change will not be covered much further in this class. Meteorology 112 instead is dedicated to this topic. Global climate change, however, is a related topic to air pollution and important to bring up here for context as we further study traditional air pollutants, those that directly cause human health problems during respiration. The right side of this graphic explains the reason for the annual rises and drops in CO2s indicated by the jagged behavior shown on the red line on the left-hand graphic. During spring and summer, CO2 levels drop by a few tens of parts per million due to photosynthesis removing carbon dioxide from air during plant growth. In fall and winter, contrarily, when the growing season ends, carbon dioxide levels rise by a few tens of parts per million as plant biomass dies off and carbon is released back to the atmosphere and as respiration exceeds photosynthesis due to reduced plant growth during fall and winter. Information about the Moana Loa Observatory where natural background levels of carbon dioxide and other atmospheric trace gases are routinely monitored is shown on this slide. 